All right, so my name is Caroline Hallam. I am the Open Educational Resources Librarian at NC Live. And today we're going to talk about our initiative, Open Education North Carolina, as well as OER in general. So I'm just going to start off with a little bit of information about why OER is so important. First off, not many people might know that um, the right to higher education is actually defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it states that higher education shall be equally accessible to all, regardless of their economic status. However, in the U.S., we're not doing such a great job of living up to that. So um, in the first decade of this millennium, so from 2000 to 2010, the cost barrier kept 2.4 million low and moderate income college qualified high school graduates from completing college. So that's um, graduates that were ready to complete college. They had all of the academic credentials. They were prepared, um, but they were unable to complete college simply due to cost. In addition, we've also seen the rise of um, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and even homelessness among our student populations. So these particular numbers are from community colleges, um, but we're also seeing this in other types of academic institutions as well. So I know that there have been a lot of food pantries that have been opened up in institutions across North Carolina. So we're seeing this um, food insecurity and housing insecurity issue across our institutions of higher learning. In addition, we're also seeing unprecedented levels of student debt. So um, for the class of 2017, the average borrower owes more than $28,650 across the US. In North Carolina, we're doing slightly better. Um, we're at 26,526, but still that's a very massive number um, for students, the average borrower to, to um, graduate with. So with all of that, um, all of those details, all of that economic strife, we can see why some students are saying, I kind of ruined my life by going to college. This is a Consumer Reports article that came out um, a couple of years ago, looks like 2018, um, where it shows that 42 million people owed $1.3 trillion in student debt. So there are a lot of different things that go into student debt, go into the costs that our students face. Um, so, of course, um, tuition and fees, room and board, uh, personal expenses and transportation all are going up and are um, bundled into that total debt number and that cost load for students. But the one thing that we as um, librarians, as faculty members, um, as administrators have direct um, control over are the books and supplies that we ask students to buy for use in the classroom. Now, you might not know this, but textbook prices have increased drastically um, in the past 30 years or so. So we can see since 1980, um, that purple line is the cost of textbooks, and the orange line is the consumer price index or overall inflation rate. So we can see overall inflation increased 200%. Of the overall basket of goods in the consumer price index increased that amount. But textbooks, we can see, increased almost to 1,000%, so about 900% there. So um, it's been very much inflated. Now, this comes from a variety of different pressures. Um, one of the biggest ones has been consolidation in the textbook industry. Now there are only five major textbook publishers. So they've definitely increased those prices quite a bit. So this is also a student success issue. It's not just a cost issue. So because these textbooks have gotten so expensive, students are not always buying the required textbook. In this study from Florida, University of Florida in 2012 and 2016, the numbers have remained fairly um, consistent across, across those studies. So um, about two thirds of students did not purchase the required textbook due to the cost. Um, about half did, took fewer courses or didn't register for specific courses that had very high textbook costs. So we can see this could also be an issue with breaking into STEM uh, because those textbooks can often be very expensive and also um, the used textbook market isn't as robust because those um, they're up updated a little more frequently than other um, textbooks for other types of courses. In addition, about a third uh, earned a poor grade, likely because they did not purchase the required textbook. 
Uh, then we also see some students dropping a course and about 20% even failing a course because they didn't purchase the required textbook and then they weren't able to complete their work. So one solution for that is open textbooks, which we'll be talking about today. So I'm just going to pop out into the chat just to double check since I can't see it from that full screen view. Okay, it looks like we're doing good. Feel free to put questions in the chat and I'll keep checking back. Okay. So open educational resources. These are freely available educational resources that are available by, via the internet. Uh, they can also be printed and uh, shared with your students, added to your learning management systems and the like. So I'm gonna show you an example first and then we'll talk about the definition of open educational resources. So here's one example. This is from an organization called OpenStax, which is run through Rice University. This is a chemistry textbook. As you can see here, it's written by um, people at universities and colleges across um, the US and around the world. Um, so this is just a few of the senior contributing authors. There's a full list of them on this page online, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. Um, you'll see the summary of that textbook. Uh, this is actually a two semester textbook. Um, and then you'll see on the left, there's a variety of ways to get access to it. So you can just view that textbook for free online without having to log in. You can also download the full PDF. There's no paywall, there's no sign in. It's just freely available on the web. Um, you can also order a print copy, which is a low cost, um, at cost basically textbook. So um, since this one's a two semester course, this is gonna be around 55 to $60. Um, but it's basically just the cost of the print version depends on how thick that textbook is, basically. Um, that's a full color version as well. And also this one has the option to download for Kindle. So you'll see different download options for different textbooks. This is just one open textbook supplier, but it's a really good example because they provide a lot of different ways to access the textbook. And these are also very widely adopted and highly regarded. So here's a look at that PDF of the Chemistry OpenStax textbook. So we can see we've got figures here. Uh, we've got chapter outlines. It's very similar to, to a commercial textbook. In addition, I mentioned before that it works with your LMS. Because this is originally digitally based, you could link to individual chapters. You could embed that whole PDF inside your course. You could break that PDF into um, different chapters if you wanted to or different sections and assign those individually. Um, and also under the instructor resources, which we'll take a look at a bit later, um, if you are using Canvas, they also have a course shell that you could import directly into your LMS. So a variety of ways to work with your LMS. And I mentioned before that they're, um, they're also available print on demand. So you'll see a variety of different um, print versions here, and we'll take a look at that, uh, how to order that online a little bit later. But you'll see sociology, that's a real thin one, so that's gonna be about 20 or $30, and then biology and chemistry, those are quite thick, so those are gonna get up to the 60s. Okay, so we've seen some examples of open educational resources. Now, uh, the definition of open an open educational resource uh, has to do with these five R's. So these are the permissions that um, something that is an open educational resource should provide the user. So first off, you should be able to keep the materials in any form. So that means you should be able to download a copy for free and then keep it indefinitely. In addition, you can also reuse it. So this means that you can reuse that content in its unaltered form in a variety of different ways. You can also revise the content. So that means that you can take that content if there's a particular chapter, that you don't feel quite fits the way you teach the class, you're allowed to take that content and revise it. You're able to um, you know, take out examples that don't really fit your, your community's context and put in your own. Um, and that's all uh, allowed through the licensing of open educational resources, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. Um, then you also can remix the content. So you can take multiple open educational resources, um, things that are in the public domain, and put them all together into a new open educational resource. And then finally, you can redistribute. So that means, so, so for those last two permissions we talked about, revising and remixing, once you do that with the open educational resource, then you can share that back out with the larger community. So those are the permissions of open educational resources. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. 
All right, looks like we're doing good. Okay, so that is the basics of open educational resources, but you might have a few questions about quality. So let's take a look. So this is a meta-analysis done by the Open Education Group um, of 13 peer-reviewed studies of efficacy, and it found that um, open educational resources, open textbooks, were as or more effective as um, commercial textbooks in these classes that adopted them. In addition, um, for student and faculty perception, about 50% um, thought they were the same, 15% thought they were worse, and then 35% thought that open educational resources were better than commercial textbooks. So of course, um, efficacy, in all of these studies of efficacy, it was found that the textbooks were as or more effective than commercial textbooks, the open textbooks were as or more effective, um, but for perception, um, they, some people thought they were a little bit worse for a variety of reasons, mostly um, some of them didn't like the way that they were formatted um, or they thought that the, that particular textbook didn't fit their class as well as the commercial version. So um, that's just perception, not efficacy. In addition, uh, there was a new uh, study that was released in late 2018 that showed that open educational resources can lower the achievement gap for underrepresented populations uh, in our institutions of higher learning. So that included um, lower income students, um, minority students, and part-time students as well. Now that's for open textbooks in the aggregate, the quality of open textbooks in the aggregate, um, but also there are uh, reviews available online for specific textbooks. So if you have a, a textbook in mind and you wanna know what other people are saying about it, see some peer reviews of it, uh, open Textbook Library is a really great place to go, and we'll go there a little bit later. Um, but here's an example of the reviews in there. So this was um, a couple years ago, so I need to get a new snapshot of this. But um, you can see that of all the textbooks in there, um, the majority had very positive reviews. So we can see that most of the textbooks in there were on the scale from one to five between four and five uh, rating. So we'll take a look at those reviews a little later, but that's just a snapshot of the quality. Okay, so open educational resources and licensing. All right, so this is just a little bit, we talked a little bit before about those permissions. This is sort of the mechanics for how you can, um, how you can have those permissions applied to open educational resources. So this is not a Creative Commons um, course here. This is not a, a presentation on that. So we won't go too in depth. There's a lot of great information available on their website. Um, but uh, we'll just, I'll just give you a, a sort of quick snapshot of this just so you understand how, how the sharing works. So um, with, when, whenever you create something and put it in a fixed form, so whether you write something, take a picture, uh, record a video, then you have rights to that content. You already, you automatically have um, copyright on that, that object. Um, but if you wanna give permission to folks to be able to remix and revise and reuse that content, um, then you can apply a Creative Commons license on top of that. So copyright is all rights reserved, and then Creative Commons licensing means you reserve some rights, but you give away others. So here are the four um, permissions that are then mixed and matched into licenses. So here's a picture of all the different Creative Commons licenses. We'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so these are the four different permissions that can be mixed together. So the first one, this is the basis of all the Creative Commons licenses, is um, CC BY. This, is, this means attribution. So you can use the content as long as you say, I'm the original author. As long as you say whoever, you know, you credit the original creator of that work. The next one here is non-commercial. So you can reuse the content as long as you're not making money off of it. So you can't, um, you can't create a course based on um, a textbook and then sell it on the internet, basically. You can't create a new textbook from 
from the textbook that you found, the open textbook you found, you can't then create a new version of that and then sell it to people. Now, this does not um, mean that you can't print things. It doesn't mean that you can't um, take an open textbook, you know, print it at Kinko's and then sell it for the, the cost of printing. That's allowed, but it just means that you can't make money off of that intellectual property, basically. You can't make money off of the actual content in there, if that makes sense. So you wouldn't want to charge on top of that print fee. We can talk about that a little bit if you have any questions about that, but just baseline, you are per permitted to print on demand, even if it has a non-commercial license. Okay, so the next provision there is SA. That's share alike. So that means that anything that you create with this licensed material, you have to put the same exact license that the original author put on it. Then finally, this last provision is no derivatives. So if you remix the content that's um, licensed in this way, you can't actually share it back. So of these four provisions, the first three are all, um, all go well with open, the, that strict definition that we talked about of, with the five R's of revising, remix, using, reusing, all of that. Um, but this last one, no derivatives, isn't technically open just because you can't um, then remix it and then share it back with the community, which you should be able to do with open educational resources. So you might see some no derivatives content um, when you're searching for OER. So it's just not technically as open because you don't get that permission right out of the box to, to revise it. Okay, so here are the combinations going from least restrictive to most restrictive. Um, again, there's ton, a ton of documentation and training about this on the Creative Commons website if you want to become a Creative Commons master. Um, but just to show you a few examples, um, once you see this licensing information, you'll just start seeing it everywhere once you recognize it. So here we have the MIT OpenCourseWare website. So the content on here is licensed CC by NCSA, which means that um, you need to attribute the original author if you reuse this material. You can't charge money for um, you know, the, the material that you create um, where you're, that, that you've revised from here. And then you also need to put the exact same license on anything that you create that's derived from this content on this website. So that means you would need to put this exact same license by NCSA on any derivatives you create. Now, another example is Cards Against Humanity. This actually has the same license as um, MIT OpenCourseWare. So you can actually make your own Cards Against Humanity deck as long as you're not making money off of it, you're sharing it with the same license, and you're attributing Cards Against Humanity as the original author. So with Creative Commons licenses, to sum up, you are free to copy, share, edit, mix, keep, and use the content that is um, licensed under Creative Commons. Okay, so to sum up this section, open means that you can, your students can, uh, instead of spending money on an expensive textbook, they can buy something else that is meaningful to them, like groceries, they can pay rent, they can go home to visit their family on holidays, they can even um, start going to their first uh, academic conference to represent research. So it means that if they don't have to spend money on a, because they already have a high quality textbook provided through open educational resources, um, it means that they can spend money elsewhere. In addition, it also means that students get access from day one. So because these open educational resources are already freely available on the web, they have access from the day the class starts. And in fact, they also have access before the class starts if they want to look through the, the material. They also have access after the class ends because they, they don't have to sell it back. It's going to be freely available on the web um, because it's, it's openly licensed. And then also it means that if you want to create your own textbook, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So um, you can work with the material that's already out there and then just adapt it for your own needs and your own community's needs. So this also means that open can provide materials tailored to your voice for the classroom. So a lot of benefits there with open. All right, so we're gonna start talking about open education North Carolina. 
looks like we're good on questions for now. So if you do have any, please just let me know. All right. So our goal over the next two years at Open Education North Carolina is to ensure that the top 30 top courses um, across North Carolina's college classrooms have access to high quality, open, free textbooks. So this um, project is being run through NC Live, which is a membership cooperative of 205 libraries across North Carolina. We serve four different communities. So about half of our libraries are public libraries. So every citizen in North Carolina should have access to NC Live resources through um, their local public library. And then the other half are academic institutions. So that includes um, the North Carolina Community College System. It includes the UNC system. And it also includes um, the independent colleges and universities in North Carolina. So um, because we're sort of ideally placed, um, we're already serving all three of those major academic communities in North Carolina. Um, we thought we were ideally placed to help out with um, spreading open educational resource use across North Carolina as well. So the first thing that we did was we went to the three um, system presidents for each of those communities, those academic communities, and then um, also the UNC press director and um, got letters of support from them. And then uh, we applied for an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant through the State Library of North Carolina, which we received. And we're um, supporting the first two years of our program on partially on that, and then also on funds that were committed from each of these systems. So the next thing that we did was we isolated the top top courses in the state. So um, these are the top 22 top courses. We're going to isolate an additional eight more and um, work on, on supporting those a little better uh, through OENC. So you'll probably see some commonly taught courses on your campuses in this list here. And then we develop some services. So the three main services we have are an actively curated repository of open textbooks that correlate to these top taught classes, just to make it easy to find open textbooks for these, these commonly taught courses. And then we also um, put together a faculty adoption grant pool of $170,000. Then we um, have been doing training across the state, um, like sessions like today, for faculty, librarians, um, administrators, distance education people, just anybody who's interested in supporting OER or adopting OER in their classrooms. And then currently we're doing a pilot with UNC Press um, to print on demand some textbooks that don't have a print on demand partner. So um, before I showed you a picture of all of those different OpenStax textbooks, OpenStax has that print on demand partner through Amazon um, and you can just order a, a textbook at the click of a button. Some of these textbooks, textbook providers do not have a print on demand partner. So, um, so we want to be able to provide that because some students really, a lot of students really do prefer print textbooks. Um, and of course, they're free to print portions of the textbook or the whole thing on their own if they want to. But we want to provide an easy bound copy as well uh, that's, that's cost effective for students. So we're hoping to expand that offering. But right now we're in the pilot phase of that. All right, so I talked about that faculty adoption grant pool of 170K. So um, the grant criteria for that, um, the eligibility criteria, is that the instructor must be employed at an NC Live member institution. And then the cost savings that are going to be provided by the adoption must be significant when compared with similar institutions. So we calculate this by asking for the number of students that are commonly in each section, uh, the number of sections that are going to be taught over the next two years, and then the cost of the commercial textbook that's being replaced. And then also we ask that the instructor should have um, either one or a selection of um, open educational resources, open textbooks that they want to use in their class. Um, they don't have to, they're not committed to that one. If they find another one, you know, right after they submit the application, that's fine. But we want them to have done a little bit of research, um, want you have to done a little bit of research to um, be ready to adopt. Then um, the textbook does not have to be from the OENC hub. 
So I talked before about this actively curated repository of open textbooks right here. Um, it doesn't have to be in there. Basically, we put together that hub of resources to make it really easy to find some good options for those most frequently taught courses, as well as to find ancillary materials. So things like slides and worksheets and test banks and things like that. Um, but if you find something else, um, or if you're teaching a class that's not one of those top taught classes, and um, you find a great textbook and want to adopt it, the, the grants are available for you as well. So you're definitely not um, limited. We're just trying to like target those top uh, classes as much as possible. So another thing is um, you can also adopt as a group. So um, if you want to adopt as an entire department or you want to do a pilot um, so that your department can see if they want to switch over to fully to an OER, um, that's fine too. You can also apply through uh, this grant program. And so what you're committing to through the grant program is to adopt an open textbook in your class for one semester and then um, basically see if it's right for you. Um, and then if it doesn't work for you, that's, that's fine. Um, you can switch back to a commercial textbook. There's no requirement to keep using OER. But um, just to skip forward, 97% um, of faculty who adopted during fall 2018 and spring 2019 are going to continue using OER. So there's a subsection of that faculty that are going to keep using OER but are going to switch to a different textbook. Um, but they're, a lot of them are very, still committed to using OER. We've only had one faculty member who has switched back to um, using a commercial textbook just because there was only one textbook available for her class, which was more of an upper level um, class. And um, it just didn't end up working as well for her. Um, but she is going to investigate um, adopting OER for some of her other classes. So here's, um, here's a representative faculty statement here. I solicited feedback from students about this resource and almost all the students loved it, especially the price and ease of use. I will definitely adopt this for all courses moving forward. Okay, so let me pop out, see if you have any questions. Please let me know if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box. Um, and right now we're going to go to nclive.org slash OENC to just look around a little bit at our offerings. So let's go to nclive.org slash OENC. I'll put that in the chat window as well in case you want to follow along. So um, some easy ways to get to this. Currently it's um, highlighted on the NC Live homepage um, down here under Featured. It's also um, available, you can just search for OENC on Google, that's one of the easiest ways to get to it, or Open Education North Carolina. And then it's also on the Four Librarians page. So if you scroll down here on the right under services, there's Open Education North Carolina link to right there. So once you get to our page, you'll find these four calls to action. So again, those sort of three big things that we offer through OENC. Uh, we also have a short introductory video about Open Education North Carolina and, OE and um, OER in general. So let's go ahead and find a textbook. So here's where our OENC collection is linked. This is that targeted hub of resources. Okay, so um, this is our hub. You can search for resources here. Uh, and then you can also scroll down to see our curated collections. Now you'll see they're really small because we're just curating one to three um, of the best textbooks for each of those top taught courses. So I'm going to go into STEM. And let's go ahead and open up a textbook. I'm going to open up Anatomy and Physiology. So what this hub does is um, it's sort of a little scoped collection of resources, and then you can review some basics about the resource here, so including that, um, that license that it's released under. So this one's Creative Commons by, so this is very, a very loose license. It's very permissive. Um, you can do whatever you want with that resource as long as you're just attributing that original author. So once you decide you want to look at the resource, you click view resource, and then it um, puts you where that resource is out on the internet. So in this case, it sends you to the OpenStax website. We have our anatomy and physiology textbook. 
very similar to what we saw with the um, chemistry textbook through OpenStax. And over here, you'll see a bunch of different ways to get the book. This has actually a few additional options, um, including Bookshare. So for this book, you actually can also download DAISY with images or DAISY text only, which is really um, a great format for using with a screen reader. So additional accessibility with that um, particular book. Um, so in here, you can easily view it online, get instant access to it without logging in. No proxy access or anything like that. You don't have to be on campus. And you can just start reading the textbook here. Um, download a PDF there. That will be the full textbook. So it might take a little while to download. Um, over here, we have our instructor resources. So in here, you'll see some Commons Hub resources. This is a place where uh, it's a group where people, uh, faculty members that are adopting this textbook can share materials that they found or created to, um, to supplement the textbook. In addition, you also have some that were provided by OpenStax themselves. So you have PowerPoint slides, you have an assessment bank, you have a solution guide, and you'll see that there's a little lock here. That just means that you need to show that you are an instructor um, for this course in order to get access to it because they don't want students to access it. So basically, you just have to submit some proof, um, which should just be um, a page from your college showing that you're an instructor in that area. Again, the Canvas course cartridge, cartridge is also available there. And we also have errata, uh, errata um, re release notes. So um, basically, people will report that there are issues with the textbook, typos, or if they find a formula didn't quite work out or a, a solution to a problem wasn't quite right, you can report it to OpenStax, and then throughout the year, they review them and then release um, updates. And then they'll, they'll just automatically um, update the book and then release these, these notes about it. So those are your instructor resources. There are also a few student resources um, depending on the book. So this one has a pronunciation guide. Um, this one also has anatomy zone. And then there's also a partner resources section. So these are not technically open because you, your students would have to pay a fee to use them. This is courseware that's offered through a variety of different educational organizations um, or uh, educational companies. You might see a few that you recognize here. Um, so currently for the OENC grants, uh, for the grants that are provided through Open Education North Carolina, um, if you're adopting something that's low cost, it's not currently eligible. We're looking for um, adoption just of open educational resources um, with, without a fee. So um, you might want to go through your own organization if you are trying, planning to use some of these partner resources where students would be charged a fee. Um, you could probably you could, uh, seek funding through your own organization uh, potentially. Um, and maybe in future years we'll allow that, but for now, um, we're just looking for folks that are just using the free resources. Okay, so that is an example of an open textbook. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so we'll go back to OER Commons. So that's one that has sort of all the bells and whistles. And you'll actually see a lot of OpenStax um, textbooks in this collection because they have a similar mission to Open Education North Carolina, which is to serve those top taught courses in the first two years of college. So you'll see a lot of open text in here, but you'll also see some other providers. So here's an example um, of a smaller provider, Stitz Zieger. It's actually just a couple of professors that have created, a couple of faculty members that have created their own algebra textbook that's well regarded. Um, but all it is is just a PDF. So you could also contact um, the original you know, authors and see if they provide any um, additional resources like you know, test banks, if they have PowerPoint slides that you can adapt and all that kind of thing, but they don't have them you know, just provided alongside this. You'd have to contact them individually. Um, but it's still a great textbook, so we have also selected this for our collection. So just a couple examples of what's in here. Okay, so um, that is the collection. Let me know if you have any questions in the um, 
chat box and then we'll go back to the OENC website. So on here, you'll also find that list of targeted courses that I showed you in the presentation. Um, and then we've got some additional open textbooks here with our OER guide. So I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, and if we go back to the homepage or go down there on the side, uh, you can also apply for a grant. So here um, you can see the eligibility information. Then you can just click here to submit your grant application, which is just a Google form. It doesn't take very long. Um, and it just has that basic information that we all already talked about the open textbook you're planning to adopt, when you want to adopt it, and then some of your goals, um, and then some yes or no questions down here at the end. So um, fairly simple. If you have any questions about it, you can always contact us. There's a link right here to um, our contact form. Uh, you can also email us or call us. Okay. So um, in addition, there's also a link to our awarded grants. It's also down here over here on the right. So if you want to peruse this, you can see some of your colleagues who have adopted an open textbook. Um, if you're teaching one of a similar class to these folks, or if you're adopting one of these textbooks, you could also um, feel free to reach out to them and um, you know, get tips or share resources with each other. Um, so that's another option there. We update that fairly frequently. Then we also have a button for getting training. So you're basically attending an OENC workshop right now. So maybe this won't be necessary for you to know about, but um, maybe if you want to send a colleague or if someone else at your institution might be interested in attending in person, um, we are offering workshops um, that has this information and a little bit more um, at these different um, locations across the state this fall, and then we'll offer more in the spring as well. So definitely sign up for that if you're interested. And we have um, we have uh, Open Textbook Network trained um, librarians that will be leading these sessions as well. Um, these folks have been working with OER for many years now, so great instructors. Uh, then we also have some advocacy materials here. So if you want to spread the word at your institution, um, we have a version of the slide deck I showed you today. Um, I'll also send out the slides that I used today to you. Um, we've also got some flyers. We've got some social media images. So plenty of stuff there to help support your own OER initiative. We have some frequently asked questions as well about OENC. And then we also have a get training, I'm sorry, a stay, stay connected section. So you can subscribe to our OENC listserv here. Um, all you have to do is select Open Education North Carolina and any other NC Live interest areas you have and put in your information. And, and you can get any updates that we send out. And then, of course, to contact us there. So very simple. Um, please let us, you know, feel free to contact us at any point if you have any questions about what we're offering. All right. Any questions, just let me know. Um, so let's go and head back into our presentation. So um, the impact so far of those grants, we already talked about um, the faculty who will be continuing to use it and how they were satisfied with using OER. Um, for the actual grants themselves, um, 144 grant applications were submitted, 102 grants have been awarded, um, and we are going to spend $111,000 on these grants. Um, and through that, uh, we estimate we're saving $6.7 million over the next two years. Um, over, almost 49,000 students are going to be impacted over the first two years of these grants. And the average ROI is for every $1 NC Live is spending on, on these faculty adoption grants, students statewide are saving $61. So we're really excited about those numbers. Okay, so that's OENC, but there's also other places where you can find textbooks. So um, here's a few different places you can go. Um, so we talked about a few of these already, but let's go ahead and take a look. So of course you can check out the Open Education North Carolina Hub to find some textbooks for those frequently taught classes. Um, but there are plenty of other places to look. So here's Open Textbook Library. This is the place that has really great reviews. 
So let's go ahead and, and look up something we already have taken a, a peek at, which is the Anatomy and Physiology textbook from OpenStax. And here we can look at the reviews. It's got 49 reviews. It's rated four out of five overall. Got some descriptions here. Um, and then let's go ahead and take a look at one of these. A lot of these are pretty positive. Let's take a look at this one. Um, so a lot of what you'll see in here um, is that they, a lot of people will say, this is a four out of five, but so was my commercial textbook. Um, and you'll also find folks that will tell you about different pieces of the textbook um, that they thought were effective or not effective so that you can sort of look through that textbook, focus on those areas. If you need to find supplemental resources, you can do that. Um, so yeah, so a really great way to find out a little bit more about this textbook. So this is also, you can find textbooks through this search. Um, I don't find it quite as effective as some of the other search tools that are out there, just because of the way their search ranking works. Um, they tend to add in a lot of additional textbooks that aren't actually really related to whatever you're searching for. Like, for instance, if you're searching for ethics, you'll get a few that are um, related to, directly related to ethics, and then you'll start getting into things that are um, much more tangential to what you're interested in. So clinical procedures for safe, safer patient care, of course, and the law of trust. Of course, ethics, you know, are a part of that, but it's not the main focus. It's not, you know, just for ethics. Um, so I find that with that search engine that it, it's not as targeted as you might want, um, but it still is a good place to find a lot of great reviews and to find resources as well. An even better place to search, um, I think, is Oasis. So this is a meta search. This is a, a search that searches across a bunch of different open educational resource providers and repositories, um, and then gives you all the results in one place. So in here, we can also search for anatomy. And we'll get all sorts of different things. We've got 250 results. We might see a few that are um, repeats because we are searching across a bunch of different repositories. So we'll not only find, for example, um, if we're just looking for textbooks on anatomy, we won't just find the um, version of the OpenStax textbook that's directly from OpenStax, but we'll also find the, um, that textbook linked to from other repositories like um, uh, BC Campus from British Columbia and things like that. All right. So um, we'll find more textbooks in here than we will find in, um, say, our the OENC hub uh, or in one place online. Um, and we can also find more ancillary materials, um, those things that go along with textbooks like modules. Um, we can also find courses, open courses that will have um, um, potentially will have uh, syllabi, sample syllabi and things like that, other additional readings that you can bring in. So just all sorts of things that you can find to support your course. So I find this to be a really great source um, to start with for searching. Um, in addition, there's another one if you want to go even deeper that's called the Mason OER MetaFinder. So this is provided by George Mason uh, University. And this is another one of those meta searches, similar to the one we just looked at, OASIS. Um, this one, if it'll load, this one does more of a deep web search for public domain um, and also includes Merlot, content from Merlot, which is a um, organization through um, University of California. So it looks like it's not loading, so we'll just um, go off of that for now. We'll see if it loads in a second. Um, but that's going to be a little bit more of an advanced search option. So if you have looked in these other places and sort of exhausted your possibilities there and want to look a little deeper, um, this one is really great. Um, you may want to, uh, if you're a faculty member, you may want to um, 
get bring in the librarian in your life <laughs> to look through that with you because it is just it's got all of the you know kind of funky search uh, things that librarians love lots of little um, filters and different search options and oh, let's see if it opened up ah. so it looks like it's not opening for now of course I'm having all sorts of technical issues as I'm trying to show you all this um, but you can search for that on your own. Um, and also we have our guide. So I skipped over that when we were on the Open Education North Carolina page here, but um, under find a textbook, you'll find our additional open textbooks guide. So here's that, that's Oasis. That's the one we just searched in. And this is the Mason OER MetaFinder that um, where you can really go in depth. So um, definitely try that out. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Okay, so those are some additional places to find textbooks. Another way to find textbooks is actually through um, some of the listservs that are out there. So there are a few great listservs that I have joined and would recommend. So here we have the Spark Libraries and OER Forum. Um, that's great for librarians. There's also a version that's just um, an OER newsletter where it just gives you news about different organizations and different happenings in, in higher education that have to do with OER. Um, the Spark Libraries and OER Forum also, um, you'll get that newsletter as well. Um, so this is a really great place. Um, you'll see a lot of people that will ask for um, help finding different resources. They're, they're helping a faculty member search for something. Um, so there's a great email discussion list there. Um, I found it really useful uh, for searching for um, for searching for textbooks. So uh, I had a faculty member that was interested in adopting an ethics textbook, and they found something that was going to sort of suit their needs, but they were going to have to do a lot of edits to it. And I searched through this. Um, I searched through the forums that I had. Um, that I was subscribed to and was able to find an, a forthcoming ethics textbook as well for her. So um, definitely a great place to look and also stay informed about what's going on in the OER world. Then we also have um, the Creative Commons uh, CC Open Education Platform. So there is a great discussion board through here too where people talk a lot about open education policy and just sort of what's going on with open education. Um, in addition, uh, these are two um, for our community college and UNC system folks. So this one is the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. This is a free, um, free listserv to join. Um, you can also join as an institution as a, as a part of this community as well and get additional perks. Um, but you can join the email group even without being a member of this organization. And this is another really great one um, for keeping abreast of OER and, and uh, OER trends and also um, finding additional OER. And then over here we have Open Textbook Network. So the UNC system um, is, has a, a membership to the Open Textbook Network. So um, there is a listserv through um, OTN, uh, but you can only join it if, you, if your organization is a member of it. So um, if you are teaching in the UNC system, um, you can join this through the UNC system's uh, membership. And again, if you have any questions, you can contact us at help at nclive.org or just go to our website and fill out a form and we will get to you, back to you as soon as possible. So thank you all so much for joining me today. I'll send out um, a follow-up email with slides and links and all of that good stuff and a recording. Um, uh, hopefully a little later today. Uh, at the latest, I'll send it out tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining me today and keep in touch.